This video was originally recorded at the annual Buddhism and Psychotherapy program held at Menla Retreat and Dewa Spa in Phoenicia, New York. To learn more about this annual program, please visit menla.us. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. You go home. Yeah. Okay. Are we all here? Anybody not here? <laughs> <laughs> Speak up if you're not here. Uh, so this morning uh, we did a meditation about wisdom. Looking for this, the absolute self and not finding it. And which, therefore, tangentially we discussed, uh, we a little bit talked about it, the famous emptiness. Or I even prefer the word voidness myself, because it's one less syllable. And then also, when you use it, you can talk about the void. And you can't really say, people do say, some other translators that like emptiness, like Jeffrey. Mm -hmm. And then he talks about the four empties. Mm -hmm. You know what you think of all beer cans like that? <laughs> <laughs> the empties, you know? Because you use it without the nest, you know, sometimes. <laughs> but the four voids you can get, you know, mm -hmm. different, different voids. So, but anyway, I haven't converted people. Just like I didn't convert people to realistic world. You're working on and that. Re <laughs> realistic mindfulness. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, but emptiness is very simple. People get all they're holding their head. Uh, my friend Jessica here, it's uh, like, oh, it's like, I can't understand. It's so simple. Because when people, the reason people get weirded out about it is they think of emptiness as like a thing. It's like they think of nothingness as a thing. Because every word has to somehow have a thing that it, that's its reference. And we don't, we're not really aware that we construct our world, you know. Like you see another person, but you think they're over there just on their own, on their own, and they just somehow they radiate towards you, and you see that like they're an intrinsic, they're an independent object, they're a thing in itself. Whereas you're actually constructing their what you see, you know. And of course, it isn't the whole of them, you know. And uh, but you do it. Your mind does it so fast. Your brain does it so fast that you think that it, what you see is out there, kind of. And so therefore, because of that way we use language, we have a word nothing, and we think there must be something that's the nothing. <laughs> then we even think we're going to go there and stuff. Have all the materialists do there, looking forward to going there, or pret and pretending to be scared about it. So, so emptiness is really, uh, means, really it equates to relativity of things. And therefore, it, it describes the way things are rather than that they aren't there. And all of the no's, like no eye, no ear, no nose, and all this kind of thing, means no eye, no ear, no nose in the way that we are habitually perceive the eye, the ear, and the nose as if it were a thing in itself. Right? And I love when people get really flustered about it, I love to tell them. You know, no self fits with that. I say, well, Buddha also said you have no nose. <laughs> and then people go like, what do you mean? Like, they go like this. I mean, I have a nose. They go like that. But then you, if you do a thought experiment, an analysis, a psychoanalysis about your sense of your having a nose, and you do a thought experiment about your nose, and then you touch this, this, this. But when you say touch, then what? How hard do you press? What surface on the tip of your finger touches what piece of skin on the nose? You could have an accident or you could go like poor Michael Jackson and decide to have a different nose, go to a surgeon and cut that off and you're still going to have a nose and you make a different nose. And yet, so therefore, no part of the nose that you touch is the, really the nose. So when you go like this, say, this is my nose, but it isn't because that could be taken off. You still have a nose. Then... The boundary between nose and cheek here, where is that? There's nobody said that's the nose and that's the cheek. There's nobody. So arbitrarily make a line if you're a plastic surgeon, you know, on a little screen, you show them, which kind of nose would you like, dear, <laughs> et cetera. But they're just arbitrary, that line. Then, you know, if you took a microscope and look at the surface of the skin on the nose, it looks like the Grand Canyon, the pores. 
So where is the nose? It's not a smooth surface, exact thing. And as you know, an exact line has no width. So it also is an imaginary thing, a line. A point has no size to be a precise point. It's a little, it's a circle. If, it's, if you see a point, what we call a point is a small circle, right? So therefore, every point on your nose is not your nose. So your nose is made up of many points that are not it. So where is the nose? It will dissolve under analysis. And you cannot respond to my challenge that you cannot find your own nose in the way you think of your nose as that your real nose. As my old uh, Mongolian Lama teacher used to say, people are not wrong thinking they are real. People go around thinking they're really real. And that's the mistake. That's the exaggeration. They are sort of unreally real. <laughs> We're constructions, you know, we're constantly constructing ourselves and we're constructing our nose and everything. And somehow that thought experiment seems like just kind of a play of the mind, you know, in a way, unless it's Einstein doing it. In that case, the whole universe blows up. But actually, if you, that thought experiment is vipassana. And, it, <laughs> and if that, if that, if that thought experiment was combined with strong concentration, you would, you would have an experience as if, you know, a, a, a level of where you would have a kind of epiphany about it or a kind of eureka moment would be where you would, you would, your nose would seem to disappear. You know, it would just dissolve under analysis. You would seem to disappear. Whatever you really analyze in thought experiment, its parts and then the parts of its parts, and parts it all comes apart. And it, it dis disappears. So that's a very powerful thing, that thought experiment. It's just that when we do it superficially through a sequence of words, it doesn't make a visceral or perceptual change. But if we do it meditatively in a concentrated and sustained way, it will definitely make a perceptual change. But on the other hand, it will not destroy the, the relative conventional nose. So the emptiness of the nose is just really freeing our way of perceiving the nose where we force things in the world to fit with our concepts of them. So then actually it gives us the ability to approach them freshly because everything being relational, there's other dimensions in things. And that's where poets, for example, function. You know, poet will see, we will see in the morning, we go out in Emily Dickinson's garden. I, I used to, we used to live in the next house to the Emily Dickinson house, which was the museum. We go out in the morning and see the little flowers that the lady taking care of it, which are the ones that Emily would write. And Emily would see those drops of dew, the little moisture left from the night on the leaves and the, and the petals. To them, they, to her, they would be lamp lights, lamps on the avenues of heaven. You know, and the little elfin carriages would be going up and down with the fairies and the angels in heaven. Whereas we just see some moisture evaporating or something. So the poet sees them freshly because they're, for whatever reason, they're dissociating or they're open or they're more open hearted or they were great yoginis or yogis in previous lives before they had the misfortune to be born in uptight 19th century Massachusetts. And, or the kind bodhisattva attitude of being reborn there. And uh, so they, they're, they, they're ready to, to see, to interact with things in, in, what, in new ways. Because they understand the relationality of everything. They're responsible for that relationality. When you don't think that your construction is the thing out there, and you realize you're constructing the way you're seeing it, you, it doesn't mean you can just sort of, that, that it's not solipsism where if you don't see it, it isn't there, because other people are seeing it, or other entities and other creatures. But it's a matter of how you see it. You become responsible for how you relate to it. So emptiness is not at all a new level of irresponsibility because everything is not there, the way false teachers teach. Emptiness is a higher level of responsibility because you're taking responsibility for your degree of creating the way things are. It's like you know when people relate to each other, your enemy then they have to always be bad and they have to always do that. You can't ever see them being nice. It's impossible for you. 
or you're a sweetheart, you know, it's always, she's always going to be great and nice, and then she like does something horrible, and then you can't cope with that. So you get in denial about it. So, so that's what this is. It's really very simple. It's really, it's really opening the door for our more complete engagement in relating to the universe. And somehow, then this is, of course, to me, the uncomprehensible thing, since I still resist and refuse to be enlightened or haven't managed or haven't had the fortune. If we're really completely interwoven with everything in a completely open-hearted manner, Relating to it all is blissful. It's all bliss. Even dying is bliss. There, of course, we know there is no dying. It's just another deconstruction and reconstruction. And we can stay aware with, we in the process. Like you, like you fall asleep and rise in a dream, and then you lucidly dream, but you're still dreaming. You don't have to wake up. And uh, you die and you're reborn. You can be conscious of that. You know, if you want to. If you don't want to, you don't have to. That, to me, I can't quite get that one, because I'm too habitually miserable. <laughs> Which makes me feel secure in this society. <laughs> right? So, so that's, I just want to demystify the whole thing. It's just, it's just, it, it's all mysterious when it's all absolute, but we're relating to it all. See, whiz, what does that mean? Those are two opposite things. If something's absolute, you can't relate to it. And yet you hear people piously intoning, God is absolute, there's absolute other, all the Protestant theologians, and yet he, and that's, that's a relative, he is kind of, you know, now with transgender we realize how relative that is, with LGBT, T, right? That's the T. And, uh, but God's a he, but yet he's absolute. Oh, he's absolute, but then he relates to the world, but it doesn't relate to him. Oh, great, oh, yes, 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 minister, or or whatever. It's ridiculous. Just a co confusion of language, as Wittgenstein would say. Okay? So just enjoy emptiness. Don't be afraid of it. And realize it's a, it's a balm, actually. Emptiness is like a medicine. It's a balm, you know? Like you put a balm, you have a sore muscle. You know, you put on a Bengay or whatever it is, and it makes the soreness less. So emptiness is a balm, and what is the balm? The bomb is what our psychoanalysis slash mindfulness people always say. It isn't what happens to you, it's how you relate to it. Because you take responsibility for your interpretation in a misery or in a success or in a joy or in another. You, you involve, you, you are aware that you are contributing to it. And so when you have a bad one, you take whatever aspect of yourself, you're contributing that, to that, you take responsibility for that. Doesn't mean you deny others' responsibility if you're something hard, someone harms you or something like that, but you're part of it. You don't act like you're an absolute separate thing and this mysteriously happened. And it's got to be just that way. <coughs> right? Okay, now let's do the meditation, a different kind. So we're going to do just a small aspect of a compassion meditation. Okay? So please go into meditative mode. And uh, in the Buddhist worldview, where everything is infinitely relative. That means that some concept of a something coming from nothing is considered in this incoherent. Everything always comes from everything, something else before. Law of conservation of energy and matter and mind is operating in Buddhist science, Buddhist worldview, and therefore, the chicken and egg problem of the universe is solved, it's beginningless. So it's not a worry. <laughs> it's really a worry of what we do with it. But it doesn't have an absolute source. It only has relative, relative things have relative sources. And, there's, and you can just go back as far there to infinity. And you never find an absolute. It doesn't come from infinity. It just keeps coming infinitely and goes on infinitely. OK? So that on that basis, our life, at the subtle level of our mental continuum, you could say our subtle mental continuum, our soul continuum, you could actually say, don't ever listen to anybody who says, oh, there's no soul in Buddhism. Soul is just a, merely just a subtle consciousness, super subtle one. 
So our soul continuum is from beginninglessness. So because of that, we've lived in every, where the, the Buddhists are way ahead of Darwin, actually, by thousands of years. Because it means that every human being has been not just their genes, but they themselves have been personally every conceivable other type of sentient being. Because it's beginningless. Once you've infinitely lived in different forms, you've lived in every form. You can't, or you at least on the more minimally, you can't say you haven't lived in a specific form. So everyone's been an angel, everyone's been a deity, everyone's been a demon, everyone's been a preta, everyone's been an animal, all different kinds of animals. Everyone's been white, black, everyone's been Jewish, everyone's been black, everyone's been yellow, male and female and androgynous. Everyone's been everything. So then out of that, you meditate. Every single living being that is present that I can think of, and there are perhaps infinite numbers of them, at some past life has been my mother in the mammal, even human form. I've been human too, infinite times, and I've been every other kind of animal, so, and everybody else has been everything to me. That's sort of the rationale that they support it with, but if you don't have that sense of an infinite past, never mind. But the point is that you can sort of do, if you have a worldview where that seems too out there and unrealistic to you, you can just say, well, in a way, everybody could be your mother, could have been. You know, like any male could have a transgender, or whatever, or like adopt you, or I don't know, give you birth in a test tube, or you know, there's all kind of weird things they could have done. Okay, so you you start to meditate in that field that we opened up last night. All the Buddhas are up there smiling at you, right? And you feel very happy, you're meditating. The medicine Buddha is there, and also all the saints, and all the messiahs, <coughs> and all the prophets, and all whoever, the elders, the rabbis, the swamis, the, the Taoist masters, they're all up there. They're smiling at you. But then around you are all beings, right? And they all, you can, it's easiest to think of them as in human form. And they all were human sometimes. And then you, would, you think of specific ones. And, and including your mother of this lifetime. And unless you've been psychoanalyzed very completely, you may not have a good image of your mother in case you can only remember when you grew up and adolescent and she was a pain and a bug and manipulative, whatever. <laughs> whatever bothered you, you know. But when you were a baby at the breast or at the bottle, if they were in some neurotic thing, culture where they didn't let you have the breast, they still cuddled and held you, and that mother's face smiling adoringly at you, seeing, seeing you as more important than Buddha. You become like a deity to the mother, you know, little baby. And you as a little baby, this, uh, you know, the other of reality that came toward you was this smiling, adoring face that would hug, hold you warmly to the breast. And then there would also be food and everything. Well, hopefully, ideally. I know they're a difficult childhood. So your mother of this life you try to reconstruct or imagine. Eventually, you actually can definitely remember because you do have that memory in your mind somewhere in some synapse, some neuron is there. If you work at it, it'll, it'll come pop up someday. But anyway, you imagine it, or if you've been a mother yourself, you remember how you felt with that newborn or if your father, you know, or you saw some other new mother and how she was. However you can find that immense thing in the normal biology of the human being, of the mammal, where that young is still really hardly separated from the mother. And the young feels that, and feels that tremendous closeness and sense of kind of it isn't really a gratitude, because I guess at the very beginning it's not even questioned. 
But that's really warm, sweet thing, you know? It really is. And if any of us are, if our brains are anyway together, which everyone here is, or they wouldn't be here, they had some sort of good experience from that, even if later they, were, they fought cats and dogs with their mom over whatever. They had that experience. They were stroked and petted and cuddled and cared for. They were helpless. That mother. And you can get really sentimental. And if you meditate on it, you'll even come to tears. The hackles on the back of your neck will you know, have goosebumps. The hackles will rise. If you meditate deeply on that, you'll get very moved. So then the meditation is, you sift back and forth with whatever you can reconstruct of the infant loving the mother and feeling loved by the mother and, and nestling in that comfort and security and warmth and pleasure and you know, alternate for that with the face or the presence of someone else. It could be someone you like, it would be easiest. And then you sort of imagine being the child of that someone and being this infant level, sort of primal mom dependent child with that person. And then you can gradually expand that and some sort of neutral person and initially, I guess you'd use females. You'd think of females because it's more, you know, you normally associate females with being moms. And then you start to get to be more difficult beings. You think of male beings, you think, or you think of beings you don't like, who have been harmful to you, who you sh shrink away from thinking about because they've, you're frightened of them in some way or averse to them in some way. So this is the meditation. It's where you expand your sense of identification with the being that you find the primal safety and security of feeling identified with. And you get all the bonuses of the identifying with this loving, adoring being. And you gradually transfer and you back and forth and you meditate and you sort of try to expand your familiarization habit to this new face, to this new presence. And then maybe another one, and then another one, and another one. And you gradually worked on this, work on this. Do you, you get it? Try it. This is a thematic, vipassana type meditation, but this is not the one that's looking for the ultimate reality of things. This is one that's expanding your way of dealing with the relative reality of things. It's working with how you identify self and other, and finding the place where you can expand your identification, where you identify with the other. Like the baby that hasn't yet had any separation thing, it feels that the breast and the mom and that adoring face is itself somehow. It's, there's no sense of disconnection from it, and that hasn't yet gone into this teeth grinding, horrible separation anxiety thing. Okay. So this is the meditation. It's called, in, in, a, in the tradition, it's called the meditation of mother recognition. And the goal, of the, the goal of it is to feel the motherliness of all beings. And in the multi-life common sense framework, which is the Buddhist one, the multi-life thing is not a mysterious or mystical leap of faith sort of thing to, to the Buddhist. In the Buddhist culture, it's the common sense. It's the consensual reality. It's like, you know, the mm, Highway 28 is out there down the bottom of the hill. That kind of reality, very, very normal. So within that, then the, the rationale is that I've been in, reborn and reborn and reborn, and beginninglessly, and so have they. So we've all, they actually have been my mother. But even we don't, without that, we can still cultivate the familiarization feeling of mother recognition.
And, and the second step is the one of remembering or conjuring kind of in your mind, imagining the sentimentally the pleasure of feeling adored in that way, of a being that is looking at you as the best part of themselves, self-sacrificingly, you know, like completely identifying with you, and then seeing you as the best of themselves. And then you get so sentimental when you really f focus on that, and being the recipient of that kind of love and affection. So you, you oscillate to that second step and back to the first step of recognizing the mother potential and then, then enjoying the mother presence and then recognizing the mother potential in this new person and then enjoying the mother presence and beginning to kind of smear the image of the new person with the, the adoring mother look, the gaga, goo goo, gaga look like sometimes we call it, of the mother, the new mother. Okay, so then if you can just see how, what we try to do in this little snippet of this, again, sustained, could be multi-week, multi-month meditation, we just kind of get the feel of it. And if you can a li little bit get where someone you look at in your mind's eye, and they, they feel very alien, sort of alien to you, like, well, you sort of know who they are, but you know, they're them and you're you. And then you sort of, begin to kind of erode that sense of boundary and, and enclosure by seeing them giving you the motherly look, kind of. The motherly affection coming toward you from them by sort of shifting that over from the mother-mother and therefore finding the motherliness in that being. You begin to get a hint of that, then you can see how you can slowly work on that to expand it where you see everyone that way. As a, as a Buddha does. And uh, that's, the, that's, the, that's the beginning of a certain type of compassion meditation. Okay? It's so ingrained in Tibetan culture. Okay, bing, that's not meditating. Then in comment, it's so ingrained in, thank you, it's so ingrained in Tibetan culture that they have actual expression, they have magen semjen tamje in their prayers and things. They say, all the old mother sentient beings, magen, ma means mother, like it does for us, and gen means elder, and semjen tamje means all sentient beings. So magen semjen tamje, they say like that. And I personally think this accounts for the, why Tibetans tend to be kind of popular they're very popular in exile in India or Nepal. People kind of like the Tibetans. And um, Chinese people like them. And uh, even, uh, you know, they have, they have police or something and they're supposed to do awful things to them. But, and in New York, you're like Tibetan nannies are like become famous in New York. There's like a, there's like a thing, right? the nanny, nanny register. They come from Queens, you know. People hire them up and down Fifth Avenue. And part of it is because I think in this culture, this Magen idea, the old mother, everyone's been the old mother of mine, is there. And so when they see people, they see them, they don't look so unfamiliar. You know the idea of seeing someone as alien? It's like the, at the root of racism, actually. It, it's a little bit, could be at the root of sexism, even, for like a real uptight male identity, rigid person. Like it's female, I'm not, I'm not female or something. I think probably maybe some females might have that about this, like funky males in some places where they're particularly oppressive. And, uh, but racism very, very clearly. And uh, it's at the root of that. It's the idea that someone's alien. 
You know, it's in the, it's in the root of the vengeance cycles, the Hatfields and the McCoys. You know, you're, you're, not, you're not a Hatfield. You know, not, you know they, you, I have this fear you're going to kill me, and therefore I have to kill you. If you're a, if you're a McCoy and I'm a Hatfield, etc. Right? You know, that's a it's a human thing, right? And uh, at the root of that is the perception of someone as familiar from family, right? Familia or family. So a conscious psychological, like a cognitive psychology thing, which becomes more deep than cognitive, what we associate cognitive with, by being connected to samadhi, you know, concentration, systematic cultivation, focus, systematic attention focus, the way their psychologies work. And um, very effective, extremely effective. When and actually, when I first was taught this, just this is I'm just, I will stop it. I'm just finishing the commentary. When I was first taught this, the guy who taught me, to whom I have deep affection and gratitude, actually, and he was such a great teacher. But he somehow omitted to mention that you you know because you say all beings, right? And so then you're but you're supposed to know, I guess, if you're a Tibetan. That that means any animals, because they're beings, right, are in a human form, because they were all humans at one point, and they just collapsed back into this much lesser awareness embodying form, and then they'll come back to human sometimes. So you should think of a human. They didn't mention that to me, so I was really having trouble with the black widow spider <laughs> and the praying mantis mom, you know. You know, and I was like, okay, yeah, she likes, she wants to eat me, but you know, she loves me. And, and I was like thinking of these weird creatures, you know, I'm trying to incorporate them in the motherliness, you see. And I, I went on it for weeks and months. But then, then when my, he, my teacher would occasionally send me to New York from New Jersey, where I was learning this, for uh, this Tibetan monastery, Mongolian Tibetan monastery, send me to see my mother of this life, who was still alive at that time. And then I would come on a bus from New Jersey to, and then to Port Authority. Then I would take the subway up to West Side. Uh, it was Broadway, 7th Avenue. Then you go through those tunnels with all these people walking like this. And I was having deja vu experiences with all of them. Because they all look familiar. And you know that thing where you, you, meet, you see somebody and, and you think maybe you know them, maybe you don't. You don't want to be rude because in case you know them, They'll think you're being rude if you don't recognize them. You don't want to feel that you're coming onto them in case you don't really know them. And you have this kind of little thing about it, you know. You figure out whether I'm going to sort of smile or I'm going to pretend I don't recognize them. I mean, I don't recognize them, so I'm going to act on that. And you get a little thing like that. You know that one? But you're having that with a whole mob of people going by like this. They're all looking like mom, you know. So you have to control yourself. It's very difficult. Because it really works. If you do this, it really works. You, people start looking familiar to you. They do. And they don't look alien. And it's like, you, mom, you know, with her. You know, feel like that. So, so it's, a, it's a very powerful thing, actually. So that's the second thing. Okay. That's relating. That's beginning to work with. And that's also the product of emptiness. Because the balm of emptiness which de-absolutizes everything. It's a bomb when you're furious anger or when you're obsessed with addictions or you're about to crush into depression where you're like, like Eckhart Tolle where you're going to kill yourself because everything is worthless in life. You're going down the drain. you know. And the bomb of emptiness is everything is relative. So it seems like it's absolutely worthless, so absolute that it's worth killing myself over. Or it seems absolutely I have to have something I'm obsessed with, and I'm, I would die to get it or kill someone else. Then the bomb is no, it's only relative. I can relate to that by not doing it. I cannot have that addictive thing. I cannot do it. I, and actually, that's why I want to translate klesha as addiction. You're addicted to lust, addicted to hate, addicted to you. Those are, we have the word klesha, which has to do with these negative emotions that people can't stop themselves. They, they've, had, they've been angry and furious and hated a hundred times and they've wounded others and themselves and regretted it when they calm down, and yet they do it when they get in a stress situation because it's like an addiction. 
And I think it's really the right word. Mm -hmm. Affliction is wrong. I, mm -hmm. I started affliction amongst the gang. Ob obscuration, isn't that the... No, no, it's different from obscuration. That's, yeah. I don't know, that's, that's an unconscious thing. That, uh. that um, it's a veil, it's a literal word, it means veil, mm. I don't know, a covering. So you're, that's a different, this is klesha, you know, which means something that twists you. Mm. Uh, it grips and it distorts and quit twists. And klish, to, to torture by distorting, you know, by twisting. And um, so those, when you're really angry, it twists your perception where you, you're helpless, driven by that anger. And you, don't, and you need the balm of emptiness, of, which is the balm of relativity. It's called the royal reason of relativity, even. And it, it, well, wait, it feels like it's absolute. I have to say this hateful thing to someone. I have to punch them. I have to shoot them. I have to this. Or I have to lustfully have this or that, no matter how destructive it might be. I have to have it. And, and uh, the balm is, it's relative. Sure, I want it. You know, sure, it seems to be pushing me where I can't stop it. But actually, since I feel it pushing, it's seemingly irresistibly, I can resist. I can choose to resist. That's where the balm fits in. But that's the medicine. From a therapeutical point of view, how... Uh, microphone. Can't hear. From a therapeutic point of view, how would you help a person that suffered a lot of trauma, say, you know, a kid, maybe from abusive parents or abandoned, an abandoned kid, to connect to that safety baseline place that you took us in the meditation. If that's addressed to me, you have to, I couldn't hear. But she's saying from a therapeutic point of view, um, how could you help someone who was traumatized maybe from an early age with, how could you help them understand this point of view? Right, right, that's difficult. Yeah. And you have to work around it, you know, if they, but even, it depends, you know. I mean, if, if someone was, um, you know, grew up in a glass castle or something where the trauma starts instantly, or they, you know, they're a total orphan or something. But even any, you know, the, those things in American orphanages, the whole generations of alienated people were created because they had this germ phobia where the nurses in orphanages wouldn't touch children. And then they found out since then that if you don't caress somebody, the brain won't develop. So we have, they, they must be Republicans. <laughs> but, but that generation, that's the, that's the no-touch generation. They, they might be some of them still alive. Maybe not. Maybe they're mostly dead, except for me. My <laughs> Jeff Sessions. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> look like that. <laughs> so, so, yeah, it's, it's some real problems. But most people, especially if they're together enough to be seeking analysis or doing something, for most people are going to have had at least some time that they've forgotten about where they were cherished, held something, then something went wrong maybe early on. You have to try to rediscover that. And if they can't remember it themselves, then you have to simulate it for them in some way, maybe by being yourself attentive and seeing them, some beauty in them, seeing something in them that they don't believe is there because nobody's ever seen it. I mean, I don't know, you're the, you're the pro. Yeah. Like, why am I, I answering I this? can talk. I don't know, I have no idea. The, there was, a, um, there was a poem that when, when Bob and I were teaching many years ago, we were circling this same kind of subject, the mother-child kind of meditation and early trauma and so on. And well, I have that. Uh, I'm going to use it tomorrow. Bob, good. Well, I'll give you a little preview. Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, Bob spontaneously said, oh, there's this um, famous Mongolian lama, 19th century lama, who at the moment of his enlightenment spontaneously declared, as is, you know, there's a tradition of this, um, I, I was like a mad child long lost my old mother, never could find her though she was with me always. And uh, uh, it goes on and he can explain and he'll, maybe he'll do tomorrow what the symbolism of all of that is. But I immediately, re, you know, related in the way that I've been talking about so far over the weekend that m many of us, not all of us, but m many of us have that kind of quality within us, you know. We're like a mad child long lost somebody, that sense of longing or incompleteness. And um, 
the meditation that we just did, which uh, Bob's framing in terms of cultivating compassion, I was thinking while we were doing it, actually what, what he's describing is the way into mindfulness also. Because, and, that, and that's sort of, what, is it okay if I talk for a while? Um, the kinds of meditation that I wanted to uh, lead you into today uh, has to do with just that, where when we're practicing mindfulness or vipassana, uh, what we're doing is simultaneously experiencing ourselves, at least it appears this way at first, as both observer and that which is observed, as both uh, subject and object as both the tender mother holding the baby and the baby being held by the tender mother. The awareness that we're cultivating, the mindfulness, the critical inquiry of Vipassana, is like the tender mother holding the infant in a, in a certain way. A, a, mother, a mother holds a baby's emotions in a certain way. Uh, uh, fathers too. Now that they've learned how to how to what, how to do this, but for the sake of the discussion, I'll, I'm going to keep saying mother. Um, the, the the mother, the what what Winnicott called the good enough mother. Uh, he's talking about that in response to an infant's uh, uh, intense eruptions of emotional life. He talks about the ruthlessness of the infant, the rage of the infant, the. Uh, combination of desire and anger that an infant directs towards the mother, but a, the good enough mother somehow intuitively knows uh, not to retaliate and not to abandon in the, in the face of the, of the infant's ruthless attacks. The mother sort of gently makes fun of the baby's intensity and nestles him or her down. So. That, that kind of attention, what he calls it the holding environment that a, that a mother creates, that kind of attention is mindfulness, okay? Or in, in, uh, in some of the mindfulness literature, they talk about it as, as bare attention, like naked attention, uh, because you're not overreacting, you know, not getting scared by or uh, agitated yourself by the intensity of whatever it is that's going on, but you're also not distancing yourself. You're not abandoning. You're not even pulling back to that sort of critical place where, well, that's a baby, but I don't know whose baby that is, and maybe somebody else can take care of that baby, you know? Um, so the, the meditation that I want to do first, I thought we could sit a little bit in this way, and then I... I could talk a little bit, then maybe we'd have time to do a, another meditation. Yeah, no, go now. Towards you the go. end. Okay. Um, well, let me just add one thing to what ahead. you just said, which made me think. And then you go. Yeah. That's a minute. Sorry. So the, the, the other thing is that you yourself are in a place as the person trying to help the traumatized person, which I think was your question. You yourself are feeling better than the traumatized person. In order to be able to help, that has to be the case. And you are feeling a kind of, some degree of well-being and so forth and so on. So therefore, you don't get sucked in to only seeing this person as a manifestation of some trauma. You see around them that they, they're, you know, they're traumatized, but you know, they're, one cell in their arm is connecting to the other cell in their arm. They have like, their heart is beating there. Blood is flowing, you know, there, 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 there's, there are things about them that are functioning and that there's, there's well-being within them or they wouldn't be alive. And then you kind of see them, therefore you gain a broader perspective on what they are only focused on, which is that I'm been traumatized. You don't get sucked into seeing that way. You're fully sympathetic and respectful that they do, but you see it in a bigger perspective. And then you, so you kind of don't get drawn into their thing. And somehow you'll get through this. You, that, that's your bedside manner. That radiates to them from your presence that you feel there is a way out. And then without you saying that to them even, then if you say that right off, then they might say, oh, yeah, it's a little easy for you to say. And they, you know, I'm keeping my, especially if they're, you know, never mind. <laughs> some people are like, I want to keep my suffering, you know. I, 
if you don't, if you don't, if you don't acknowledge my suffering, then it's terrible. So you are like, like, oh, poor dear. Like, just like a mom, you know? I mean, you, when, when Noah's freaking out and he stubs his toe, you're like, but you don't overdo it, you know? Like, it's not, you know, yeah, you know, it's toe, it's, oh, poor boy, but you don't overdo it because then you don't want them going around stubbing their toes to get some maternal affection. So you don't overdo it. You say, yeah, it's terrible, but yeah, look, the other toe is still there. <laughs> Whatever it is. So that's a cosmic thing. Otherwise, how could Buddha become Buddha? When we here we are, we're not Buddha, we think. Because he sees that the way we think about what we are is mistaken. And he would reflects that and leaves us uh, methods and teachings, all kinds of things to get out of our trauma of being miserable. But he sees us as actually more, re, more embedded in nirvana than we know. So he's optimistic that we'll get there. And that, that vibe comes to us when we really open up in the world to what a Buddha actually is. You know, but of course, in our, in our culture, we don't have a concept for Buddha. As I said the other day, I think even the worst is my field of what they call Buddhist studies, academic. They don't acknowledge there could be such a thing as a being with a higher consciousness that truly identifies with every other being as if they were the mother. They say a Buddha is like a, sees all beings like a mother sees her only beloved child. So a Buddha is a being who identifies with us like that infinitely throughout space and time even. It's like, therefore, inconceivable to us. And therefore, the Buddhist studies people automatically think there's no such thing as just a fantasy that some weirdo people in Asia are cooked up. You know? <laughs> but, uh, but people who've, uh, who've had a little bit of slippage of consciousness in our culture, you know, who've encountered some different experience of the way they see things, realize the constructiveness of how they see things by having it all dissolved under a kind of analysis. Uh, they, 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 can, they can cope with the idea of some kind of higher consciousness. Okay? So yeah. I just wanted to add that, what you were saying. That's fine. And that's, because you got to use this, you, the analyst, are the presence, and the good enough presence. It's something like that. And, uh, yeah, we mean uh, something like that. Well, definitely. Uh, Look at that smile. <laughs> what? About, about 20 years after I had first spent time with Ramdas. Yeah. I went to visit him after he'd had a stroke. Oh, Ramdas. Yeah. Ramdas. And he was sort of, he was sort of, he was sort of, he was sort of teasing me. Yeah. Like, oh, are you a Buddhist psychiatrist now? You, you know. <laughs> and, right. and I was like, yeah, I guess that's what I'm trying to do. And he said, uh, do you see them as already free? Do you see your oh, patients yeah, yeah, as good. already yeah, free? Yeah, he's so clever. He was good. He's a, he's a shrink. He's a psychologist yeah, himself. Well, that, he's who I learned from to begin with. But that's what you're talking about, too. Exactly. Like, to have that. And, and I think that's one of the things, like, a conventional, un-Buddhist trained psychotherapist might or might not be able to do that. But one of the things that I got out of immersing myself in this world I first think we need a new was, training. For, yeah, I think so. Yeah, when, when Dr. Epstein retires and moves all the way to Woodstock, we'll set that up. OK, that, okay. Yeah, at Menla. <laughs> <laughs> um, Definitely. No, because this training is just like, you know, like a book. Yeah, There's a book. We're talking about addiction. I did a blurb on a book, which I can't remember the title. I can't remember the name of the author or anything. But the blurb. But <laughs> Tell us the it's blurb. It's a book. And it's a guy who was a long-term addict on and off. And finally, he really got off at least long enough to write the book, <laughs> maybe a few years. And he made a big thing about how you have to have the, you know, he's an AA, you know, 12-step program, but you also have to have a meditation practice. And so it's a combination of them is the only thing that worked, and then he was helping others do it, and, you know, and it, was, it was a good book, so I did a book, that's great. Mm -hmm. So we have to expand. That's, that's where, you know, the Dalai Lama is very big about, he doesn't want everybody to be a Buddhist. You know, it's not necessary, and it's even not good. Because if everybody starts becoming a Buddhist, then the Christians will come and burn them all to stake. <laughs> and the Southern Texas Baptists will come with guns. And so it's much better that, he, like Dalai Lama says, oh, you guys, you don't need to convert us. We love you. You're great. We're going to learn how you do things, and we'll do things. And we don't want to convert you. But anything you can learn about meditating as a Christian, that might help you be a better Christian. That's the thing. And we can learn from you how to be more activist, maybe, and our Buddhists tend to sit too much on their pillow. We could found a hospital and, uh, you know, whatever. We could do that like the nuns do, you know. And we'll try to do that. And that's the way we should relate in the modern age where people are too much cheek by jowl. In one big city, there's like every religion. And if they start fighting, it's like chaos, you know. 
And so, um, but the service of the psychology of the Buddhist science, that's what can be reinforced the Western science. Western science, by this dogma of considering everything material only, uh, is constricting its effectiveness, actually, especially in the psych realm. And whereas Buddhism can help out by, say, by saying, well, there's ways of doing this, your biology and your psychology and your neuroscience, where you're going to take the mind itself seriously and see how that can be dealt with scientifically. Just if you admit a mind back in, it doesn't mean you're admitting some irrational bunch of hells and gods and grisly medieval Western, you know, torture chamber, grand inquisitor, inquisitor culture. You don't have to go back to that, right? So that's the thing. That's the service. So all religions should realize that this came to me. I had a eureka moment in a in a consulting kind of one of those seminars, you know, for CEOs. Mm -hmm. Religions are service industries. And as long as they remember they're serving their population, then they should impose, we wanted to improve the quality of their service. When they think they are ownership industries and they own their believers, and then they want to increase their market share, then they are, they're broken as religions. They're ruined as religions. And they're not providing a service. They're capturing. They're, they're just uh, they're empires, trying to make empires. And that's not what, the, not what Jesus meant, not what Moses meant, not what Rabbi Hillel meant, not what, not what Swami meant, not what Buddha meant, not at all. Didn't want to own anybody. He doesn't even own himself. If you identify with all beings, if you have such a consciousness, you don't even own yourself, actually. Speaking Boring of which. to own yourself. Speaking of which. <laughs> okay, I okay. said I'm gonna shut up. No, you can talk, but we're and we'll listen. Um, let, Onward. Let's go into a meditative position. Okay. So the physical posture we know, relatively comfortable, supported if you need to be supported, back as straight as you can, shoulders back. Bob is practicing this now. Shoulders back, so that the chest is a little bit open here. Right? Your head, you can feel a line. Uh, uh, there's no such thing as a line, but you could imagine it anyway. You, you feel a, a thread pulling up from the center of your uh, scalp, uh, fastening you to the ceiling, and that thread goes down to your pelvis. Feel yourself supported by your pelvis. Relax your arms, relax your shoulders, relax your breath. Don't force the breath in any way. Remember the phrase of Thich Nhat Hanh when he was asked uh, uh, about anger. He said, to hold anger like a baby. I was never sure if he meant hold anger the way a baby holds anger or hold anger the way you would hold a baby. So you can try it, you can try it either way if you start to feel angry. But for the moment, just feel yourself who you imagine yourself to be sitting here in your body, having come to Menla, having spent the day, having had breakfast and lunch and a rest, learned about emptiness, all thoughts circling through your head. Don't try to stop them. Make room for them. Make room for your physical experience also. And just allow, allow the silence, allow the silence, allow the external sounds, allow the internal sounds, should there be any, allow the feelings, the sensations of pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral, sensations in the body, sensations from the sense organs. Try to notice if you're drawn to the pleasant ones, if you're repelled by the unpleasant ones. Try to treat them all equally. They're all your children. <coughs> Just make room, sit, feel, 
make room for yourself, the entirety of yourself, the mysteriousness of what you are in this moment. And try to keep a, a meditative posture going along with the physical posture. As much as possible, don't move the physical posture. If you're in pain, if you have to move, fine. But otherwise, try to maintain it without moving. Also, try to maintain the mental posture. The mental posture is what I mean by bare attention or naked attention. the clear and single-minded awareness of whatever is happening to you or in you at the successive moments of perception. Clear and single-minded awareness. Just the bare facts, like an exact registering moment to moment, Silence, sounds, thoughts, feelings, sensations, memories, plans. Whatever arises in your awareness. But try to stay attentive to when you stick to something that comes up when you start to cogitate about it, when it grabs you is what I'm trying to say. When you have some kind of reaction to whatever it is that's passing through your mind, try to differentiate. That's the vipassana, the differentiation. Try to differentiate your ego reactions, your mental reactions, your emotional reactions from the, the raw core sensory events. It's easiest to see that with physical sensations for like pain. Pain is a, a raw sensation, but you'll be like, ugh, you know, you don't like it, and you might clench up around it. Try to see those two things as separate and bring yourself back to the raw sensation if you're unlucky enough to be experiencing pain already. But it holds for other experiences also. Be very uh, aware of whatever kind of judgment Self-judgment, other judgment, that sort of criticalness that's, that's uh, actually a protective, self-protective ego function. Don't create it, don't go looking for it, but if it, if it should come up, note it, just note it for what it is. Oh, judging, judging. Just try to keep that open awareness, not resting it on any one thing, but allowing, allowing whatever is flowing through you to flow uninterruptedly. If you're having a lot of thoughts, just note them as thoughts. Try not to get drawn into the content of the thoughts. It's very rare that we have original thoughts, like a thought you've never had before that you really need to pay attention to. Should you have a thought like that, it's okay, great. 
but most of our thoughts are routine and repetitive. So in meditation, you can start to just note them as thoughts. Oh, that's the thinking process. Process versus the content. So you'll obviously be aware of the content, but you don't have to dwell in the content. Let it float kind of uh, above your awareness. <coughs> Stay more in the awareness than in the object, if you can. If you have a, a trace of an emotion, what you might consider a positive emotion or a negative emotion, uh, if you should note any kind of emotional upheaval, try to just try to notice what it is and experience it in your body if you experience it in your body or in your mind if you experience it in your mind. But again, like with the thoughts, don't get too drawn in by it. Just let it kind of percolate. Let it do what it would do without you, so to speak. And again, you don't have to go looking for it. it just if it should come. Pay attention to whatever is most prominent in your experience, <clears throat> even if it should be what we call nothing even if it's just stillness. There's a famous Japanese haiku about this. The old pond, a frog jumps in, plop. <clears throat> so the old pond is like your mind, or maybe it, it's this meditative awareness. The frog jumping in is like the baby within you or the thought, or a sound, or a feeling. Plop, the reverberations that it creates between you, within you. And you're just feeling them, you're just seeing them, you're just sensing them. So the meditative posture is, it's impartial, impartial, choiceless, open, and in many ways impersonal. 
just allowing. Not pushing away the unpleasant, not holding on to the pleasant, not pushing away the pleasant, not holding on to the unpleasant. If you should experience doubts about your ability to actually do what I'm asking you to do, just note that as doubt. Oh, that's just a mental formation. That's doubt. See how it feels in the mind. If you feel restless, you want it to stop, just sit back into yourself a little more. Feel what it's like to feel restless. Oh, restless. If you found something to worry about, you remembered something, something to worry about. Just back up from it a little bit and experience what it's like to worry. Not the thing you're worrying about, but the worrying, worrying state of mind. Try to observe that as it changes. Try to observe things as they change, <coughs> moment to moment as they pass through you. So why do, we, why do we need to do this? Why do we need to learn this? What? What's that? Mm -hmm. Okay. This, um, this thing I want to read to you is from uh, our friend Sharon Salzberg's uh, book that's called Faith. Which one is it? Faith. It's from her book called Faith. Oh, yeah, that, that book, right. You know that book? Yeah. So yeah, Sharon, sometimes, <coughs> sometimes Bob and I teach with Sharon over the years. It's yeah, we haven't been doing it. We anymore. haven't been we doing it. She's been so busy. Um, but she's written a number of books about her own experience. The, the one where she reveals the most about herself psychologically is in this book, Faith. And uh, uh, I found it, uh, when she first wrote it, I, I was very moved by how courageous it was. And then I didn't look at it for a long time. And then recently I started looking at it again. And um, I, I think it's really a helpful thing, what she wrote. Uh, and it pertains to everything we're talking about, because it's a very good example of uh, how the ego uh, 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 takes hold and in its creatively constructive way builds a, a 
a, a, a cage for us that, uh, like a klesha that Bob was talking about, how it contorts us, torments us, tortures us, obstructs, uh, obstructs our, our experience. And Sharon, Sharon was writing very movingly, I find, about uh, her discovery of that in herself. Um, so it's, it's sort of a, an extreme example. Uh, we haven't all suffered in the way that Sharon suffered, but, but I think it's um, universal enough that um, it's easy to relate to. So uh, this, is, this is, you okay with the sound? This is from the very beginning of her book. It's called The Journey of Faith. And again, I think she's talking faith. I gave her the Michael Eigen uh, a book about faith that, uh, to read long ago, and she, she said it was too hard for her to understand. But I think she's actually talking about the kind of faith that he was talking about in the piece I read to you yesterday. Uh, you know, a faith in experience, uh, one, e even when you've gone through all the horrors of yourself. You know, a faith that experience is worthwhile, no matter how traumatic. Uh, it, it has been. So th this is her beginning of that. Each of us tells ourselves some kind of story about who we are and what our life is about. As is the case for many, the story I told myself for years was that I didn't deserve to be happy. Throughout my childhood, I believed that something must be intrinsically wrong with me because things never seemed to change for the better. My father, whom I adored, disappeared when I was four, and my mother and I moved in with my aunt and uncle. One night when I was nine years old, my mother and I were home alone. She had recently undergone surgery and seemed to be recovering well. In celebration of her return, I was wearing my ballerina Halloween costume. We were sitting close together on the couch, watching her favorite singer, Nat King Cole, on television, when suddenly she began bleeding violently. I ran out into the hallway to get someone to help us but couldn't find anyone. My mother managed to tell me to call an ambulance immediately and then to call my grandmother, whom I hardly knew, to come get me. Shaking uncontrollably, I complied. After that evening, I never saw her again. About two weeks later, she died in the hospital. After that, I lived with my father's parents and rarely heard mention of my mother again. My childhood continued to unfold through terrifying, uprooting turns and incomprehensible losses. When I was 11, my grandfather died, and one day my father returned. The handsome prince I'd secretly imagined had been replaced by a disheveled, hard-bitten, troubled stranger. Six weeks later, he took an overdose of sleeping pills. That night, my father entered the mental health system. He was never able to function outside of it again. One of the hardest parts of all the loss and dislocation was that it was surrounded by an ambient, opaque silence about what was happening. That's one of my favorite phrases of hers, an, an ambient, opaque silence. I, I have another friend whose mother committed suicide when he was like, I forget, four years old or five years old or something like that. And uh, he said his father came downstairs the next day and said, your mother left and isn't coming back, and uh, no one ever talked about her again. I th so that, you, you know, these are smart uh, people, but I think that the trauma of this kind of thing is so great that people really can't handle it. And so what is there instead is what Sharon is calling this ambient, opaque silence, uh, which then gets introjected in the way I was talking about this morning, gets incorporated into us, into her in this case, so that she's got this ambient opaque silence cloaking her experience that she then has to you know, um, take apart piece by piece um, in the future. Let me, anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, um, because no one spoke openly or even, or even acknowledged all the changes as loss, my immense grief, anger, and confusion remained held inside. Whenever the cover slipped, I scrambled to hide the feelings or distort them so no one would really know, especially not myself. The story I was telling myself was that what I felt didn't matter anyway. I'm reading you an edited version of the chapter. 
Feeling so different, I liked playing it safe more than anything, seeing life from a distance, never really engaging, preferring to lose myself in the seductive play of listlessness. What, what some therapists would say in situations like this is that those very intense emotions that she was experiencing that no one would name for her, that she probably couldn't name either. So that they, they, these intense feelings that we would know, you know, loss, grief, sadness, anger, all the five stages of Elizabeth Kubler-Ross and so on, bargaining, uh, um, they would never be identifiable to her subjective consciousness. They would just be a like sort of chaotic swirl of discomfort that she's pushing away and instead replacing with what she's calling her, her own listlessness. Okay, so I didn't care about anything, or so I hoped it seemed. I came to know very well the protection of distance, of a narrowed, compressed world, though it was my own act of pulling back, and that there's again the creative construction that she's able to own, though it was my own act of pulling back, I felt forsaken. I told myself a story that there was no way out of the world that turned me in upon myself. Years later, as an adult, I would find the phrase that perfectly described my dilemma. Some friends and I had rented a house near the ocean where we could practice meditation on our own for a few days. In my designated bedroom, I found a Peanuts comic strip on the desk, which went something like this. Lucy is sitting in a little booth a doctor is in sign prominently displayed. She tells Charlie Brown, you know what your problem is, Charlie Brown? The problem with you is that you're you. Crushed, Charlie Brown asks, well, what in the world can I do about that? Lucy responds in the final frame, I don't pretend to be able to give advice. I merely point out the problem. <laughs> in fact, until I was 18, Lucy ruled. My resistance to participating more fully in life came to feel like the most alive, vibrant thing about me. I often found myself in many endeavors not really trying because I was secretly sure that I would fail. I'd learned well to hold life in abeyance. For years, I hardly spoke. I barely allowed myself a full-blown emotion. No anger, no joy. My whole life was an effort to balance on the edge of what felt like an eroding cliff where I was stranded. That's the other th phrase I like from her writing. My whole life was an effort to balance on the edge of what felt like an eroding cliff where I was stranded. I was waiting, suspended. I once asked a psychiatrist friend what he considered the single most compelling force for healing in the psychotherapeutic relationship. She says this wasn't me. I thought it was me for a while, but she said it's another friend. She has another psychiatrist friend. <laughs> love, he, love, he replied. I agreed with him about the transforming power of love, but wondered if there wasn't something else even more fundamental. For all we know, I suggested, what is most important to healing in therapy is that people show up for their appointments. The therapist's love can nurture healing, but it is our own faith in that possibility that impels us to show up and take each new step into the darkness. To see such possibility for myself, I first had to reach within the lassitude, coiled tightly around my heart, and begin transforming how I felt about my heart and about myself. I had to give up my protective distance, alter my habit of withdrawal, and learn to participate, engage, link up. I had to acknowledge that underneath my facade of indifference, I cared, and in fact cared a lot. I cared about what happened to me and what happened to others. I cared about life. So she got there. I skipped over the page where she talks <laughs> about at 18 she went to India and found her meditation teachers, and they gave her this method that I was uh, trying to introduce to you uh, that allowed her to uh, begin to uncoil that thing that had um, uh, twisted her heart. Very real things, you know. Um, and, and I think it's interesting. You can hear there would be a way to um, read that protective distance, that not caring too much about anything. You could see someone who was misunderstanding 
a meditative approach to life as using it uh, in that way, where, where equanimity is instead experienced as a kind of disengagement. Um, and I think that, sh that Sharon, who uh, went on to write movingly about the kind of compassion, uh, loving kindness, metta, and so on that Bob was uh, teaching us earlier, uh, uh, she, she found that first in herself, where she, she was able to do what I was asking you to do at the beginning, to, to be both parent and child for herself, so that even though she had those horrible losses, uh, it, you know, and I think helped by some wonderful teachers who she found who she could use in the in the place of uh, what she had lost. She began to find that lost mother with, you know, inside of herself. Um, but but I think that way that she's talking about participating, engaging, linking up, we don't always hear that uh, from from uh, from the Buddhist side. Although we should, it's a misunderstanding not to not to lead with that in a way. Um, so I like to pair this Sharon's uh, description with what another poet who, um, uh, who I really like a lot, although I'm no expert in her, but I, I've read a few of, of Louise Gluck's poems. And um, uh, this is from about 10 years old from The New Yorker where there was a portrait of, of Louise Gluck. Uh, and I just want to read you, I won't read you as much, but uh, just uh, some little bits about her because she um, also uh, is a very good example of someone. She, in her poetry, she went back to sort of um, explicate this the way Sharon did in her writing. But she's a very good, very good example of someone who, because of a traumatic early upbringing, uh, her creative construction was to shut down her emotional life, to shut down her feeling life, um, as you'll see when I read. And then her... Uh, uh, her writing life, uh, aided uh, by some, uh, uh, also by some psychoanalysis, um, and I think leading her slowly, slowly towards something uh, a little more spiritual, uh, started to open up a uh, suppressed feeling life. Uh, and so I, I wanna, I'm going to read you that, but this is all in the service of uh, when we practice mindfulness, when we practice bare attention, when we practice meditation, when we practice vipassana, uh, it can be tempting to use all of those practices to distance ourselves from those aspects of ourselves that we're uncomfortable with. And it can be tempting to do that, and it is possible to do that. And uh, I, I've seen ev even in... Um, uh, the the v v uh, Vipassana teachers who I have learned so much from, I have seen that tendency in many people who have both taught and practiced in that world that I hold very dear. So I, I, I see it as you know, one of my main uh, things that I'm always trying to push, uh, which, which is that uh, emotional life doesn't have to be the enemy, you know, that in fact it's where all the, where the richness where the energy, where the, where the, the uh, interdependent uh, emptiness uh, actually resides. So uh, this is Louise Gluck, or this is uh, uh, the New Yorker writer writing about Louise Gluck. Um, I'll just give you a little of the history. She was born in 1943 in New York City and raised on Long Island. A sister died before she was born. Her death was not my experience, but her absence was, Gluck writes in an essay. Her death let me be born. That severity of judgment is typical of her, who often pairs experience down to brutal cause and effect. There's a little bit of the bare attention in that pairing experience down. But um, so I'll skip most of the article and just give you the, the, uh, what I think is uh, what, what relates to what we're talking about. When she was 16, Gluck, suffering from anorexia, nearly starved herself to death. Her formal schooling was sporadic from that moment forward. She spent seven years in psychoanalysis and eventually apprenticed herself to two poets, first Leonie Adams, then Stanley Kunitz, both of whom she met during a brief period at Columbia. Anorexia seems to have been a clumsy early form of writing poetry, focusing exclusively and therefore tragically on form. Analysis, which replaced anorexia by describing it, would then be an improvement, 
except that it had no form. Its truths were inert and abstract. Only in poetry could the formal manifestations of insight be explored, a fact that she explores in form in a section of a poem called Dedication to Hunger, uh, from uh, a, a, an aspect of that called Descending Figure. And this is the, the um, part of that poem. But did you follow all that? I think that was very interesting. The uh, anorexia is a, uh, again, it's as, the, as a creative construct, as an attempt to deal with something, you know, tragically and, and only with the body. And then psychoanalysis as helpful, putting language on things, but still very abstract. And then her own need to actually name uh, what's happening within her. And that naming, uh, that's part of Vipassana meditation also, part of uh, the whole Buddhist approach. Uh, it's not just freely floating in the abstract, uh, uh, swirling worlds of awareness. It's looking very clearly and precisely, dissecting, taking apart, analyzing, uh, and putting words on uh, what the experience is. And uh, Bob sometimes talks very movingly about how uh, people think of meditation as uh, you know, erasing thought, eradicating thought, go, dwelling in a kind of uh, thoughtlessness, you know, but that that's really just stupidity. And that the, uh, the conceptual aggregate, they say in Buddhist psychology, meaning the thinking mind or the identifying mind, critical mind, never goes away. So even if you're dwelling in, in uh, absence, you're still identifying it as absence, so, et cetera. But this is Louise Gluck's poem. It begins quietly in certain female children. The fear of death, taking as its form dedication to hunger. Because a woman's body is a grave, it will accept anything. I remember lying in bed at night, touching the soft, digressive breasts, touching at 15 the interfering flesh that I would sacrifice until the limbs were free of blossom and subterfuge. I felt what I feel now, aligning these words. It is the same need to perfect, of which death is the mere byproduct. The, the writer, I think very uh, carefully, takes this apart a little bit. Blossom is what grown-ups say little girls' bodies do. To the girls, it feels more like subterfuge. That pair of words reveals so much about what drove Gluck in poems like this one, the need to perfect, certainly, but what poet doesn't feel some version of that need? Gluck's provocative difference was to link perfection with forms of defiance. As she writes in another poem called Education of the Poet. I guess this is an essay, really, not a poem. By the time I was 16, a number of things were clear to me. It was clear that what I had thought of as an act of will, an act I was perfectly capable of controlling, of terminating, was not that. I realized that I had no control over this behavior at all. This is the addictive thing that Bob was talking about. And I realized logically that to be 85, then 80, then 75 pounds was to be thin. I understood that at some point I was going to die. Even then, dying seemed like a pathetic metaphor for establishing a separation between myself and my mother. <laughs> so then she goes into uh, uh, psychoanalysis and starts to loosen up a little bit. And uh, they, just a couple of little bits of poems here that are nicer. Um, one. As I saw it, all my mother's life, my father held her down, like lead strapped to her ankles. She was buoyant by nature. She wanted to travel, to go to the theater, go to museums. What he wanted was to lie on the couch with the times over his face so that death, when it came, wouldn't seem a significant change. <laughs> Just one more that I like. Uh, There's plenty to be sad about in Gluck's recent work. This is the end of the piece. We expect her to be adept at delivering bad news. But all that severity is paying some tremendous dividends now in a poet who has been on record about misery all along. 
These new poems are funny, abundantly social, and often where we expect a bitter judgment, merciful. Here she is in fugue, remembering a child's game of family. I was the man because I was taller. My sister decided when we should eat. From time to time, she'd have a baby. <laughs> Later, in the same poem, she retells a dream. I had a dream. My mother fell out of a tree. After she fell, the tree died. It had outlived its function. <laughs> she could be mean. Uh, and in Crossroads, one of many sublime lyrics in a, a book called A Village Life, after a lifetime of combating her body, she makes the most unlikely truce of all. My body, now that we will not be traveling together much longer, I begin to feel a new tenderness toward you, very raw and unfamiliar, like what I remember of love when I was young. And so that's nice, right? Fits right in. Um, and then I found a poem of hers that's about her psychoanalysis. That um, the first half is about her psychoanalysis, which if you can, can, can you stand one more? Yeah. OK. So the poem is called The Sword and the Stone, which you could think about what that might refer to. She might be the stone, I think. My analyst looked up briefly. She's on the couch. Naturally, I couldn't see him. But I had learned in our years together to intuit these movements. As usual, he refused to acknowledge whether or not I was right. My ingenuity versus his evasiveness, our little game. At such moments, I felt the analysis was flourishing. It seemed to bring out in me a sly vivaciousness I was inclined to repress. My analyst's indifference to my performances was now immensely soothing. An intimacy had grown up between us, like a forest around a castle. The blinds were closed. Vacillating bars of light advanced across the carpeting. Through a small strip above the windowsill, I saw the outside world. All this time, I had the giddy sensation of floating above my life. Far away, that life occurred. But was it still occurring? That was the question. Late summer, the light was fading. Escaped shreds flickered over the potted plants. The, the analysis was in its seventh year. I had begun to draw again, modest little sketches, occasional three-dimensional constructs modeled on functional objects. And yet, the analysis required much of my time. From what was this time deducted? That was also the question. I lay, watching the window, long intervals of silence alternating with somewhat listless ruminations and rhetorical questions. My analyst, I felt, was watching me. So in my imagination, a mother stares at her sleeping child, forgiveness preceding understanding. Mm. Or more likely, so my brother must have gazed at me. Perhaps the silence between us prefigured this silence in which everything that remained unspoken was somehow shared. It seemed a mystery. Then the hour was over. I descended as I had ascended. The doorman opened the door. The mild weather of the day had held. Above the shop, striped awnings had unfurled, protecting the fruit. Restaurants, shops, kiosks with late newspapers and cigarettes, the insides grew brighter as the outsides grew darker. Perhaps the drugs were working. At some point, the street lights came on. Then, then it goes on. It's, it's beautiful, the rest of it, but, um, but I don't need to read it to you now. But you could see her um, coming to life. I mean, that's the point. Uh, and uh, the uh, yeah, it's from a book called called Faithful and Virtuous Night. Oh yeah, it's a nice. Uh, every, all the poems are amazing. Um, so again, like with Sharon, you know, these are these are um, extreme examples, but I think representative of the way that the the clashes, the the way that the ego, the way that we. Uh, 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 wrap ourselves around ourselves and uh, suppress what we're capable of 
as human beings. And uh, uh, these various strategies of mindfulness, of meditation, of psychoanalysis, of psychotherapy, these various strategies have arisen to wake people up, which, you know, is the Buddha, the, the Buddha is wakeful, to wake people up to themselves. And you can see the, um, uh, the bit of flirtation that she's having with the, you know, the forbiddenness, but the, the, the sly vivaciousness, you, you know. Uh, the restraint of the analyst, that, that like the restraint of the mother, that allows the person to come forward without fear of violation, you know. Um, uh, uh, also very important in meditation, teacher, student, uh, uh, and within yourself. Uh, uh, as you're uh, beginning to allow forbidden feelings, forbidden impulses, forbidden memories. Uh, and ag again, if that's not what's happening in your meditation, you don't have to create it. This is only you know, for those of us who, for whom this kind of stuff does arise. The, the mental attitude, the mental posture, the mental approach, that you take to all of that stuff, it should be modeled after w one of these, uh, uh, you know, uh, after the poet, uh, uh, after the mother, after the psychoanalytic stance, so that you're giving permission, you know, but not indulging and not reacting in horror, but making space, making room. Okay, is that clear? Um, one more thing, and then maybe we can meditate again before dinner. Yeah. It's basically not indulging, not pushing away, not reacting in horror is, I think, what I said. But they're all variations on the same thing. You know, we're, we're uh, uh, in, in meditation, it's like, cleaving to the pleasant and pushing away the unpleasant, or if you're some, in some kind of masochistic state, you might cleave to the unpleasant and push away the pleasant. The, um, the Buddha did that himself in his, uh, his self-analysis before he discovered the middle way. He was like an anorectic patient in that he was, you know, he stopped eating, he was suppressing all of his, all of his feelings, he was trying to get to a transcendent place that was you know, above the body, beyond the body. And uh, it wasn't until he had uh, um, the one time a childhood memory comes into play in the, in the Buddha's biography. He's at the height of his self-abnegation, sort of like Louise Gluck. And then he, he remembers himself as a young child sitting under a rose apple tree uh, with his father plowing in the distance. And uh, he remembers how good he felt there, you know, a sense of joyfulness. In the Tibetan version, uh, he sees these uh, ants in the ground, and, uh, and uh, that the father's plow might um, might kill, and he reaches to uh, save them. Uh, so the feeling of compassion comes in in that view. But uh, he spontaneously remembers the, this, these um, beautiful feelings, and he thinks to himself, "That's really weird. Why am I having this memory and remembering these feelings just when I'm about to?" extinguish you know, my, all, all of my passions uh, as well as my body for the uh, final time. And um, uh, he's, uh, he's curious enough that he stops and he thinks, you know, I've been doing this for a long time and I really haven't been getting anywhere. Maybe this memory is trying to tell me something. Maybe these feelings are, are, are actually the way, something I should pursue, something I should cultivate. But he thinks with a body, sort of like Louise Gluck, you know, with a body this emaciated down to 75 pounds, I wouldn't have the strength to support those feelings, so I better eat something. And uh, so then a, a, a young woman appears with a, a rice porridge for him, and he eats and gains strength, and then three days later he's enlightened. So it's a kind of recovery of the, um, uh, the ability to feel. Um, there was one other thing I wanted to read here. This is again from um, uh, Michael Eigen. Sorry. Yeah. Um, so this is my psychoanalyst friend, Michael Eigen, who is the closest one I know who, who comes to a, a spiritual place. 
uh, and he's writing about his, his own experience. Uh, I remember once being in, emotional, being in emotional agony on a bus in my 20s. I doubled over into my pain and focused on it with blind intensity. As I sat there in this wretched state, I was amazed when the pain turned to redness, then blackness, a kind of blanking out, then light, as if a vagina in my soul opened, and there was radiant light. The pain did not vanish, but my attention was held by the light. I felt amazed, uplifted, stunned into awareness of wider existence. Of course, I did not want the light to go away and was a bit fearful that it would, but above all was reverence, respect. It could last as long as it liked and come and go as it pleased. It was an unforgettable moment. Life can never be quite the same after such experiences. So he, he got there, you know, pain, but with attention, the reactive component of the pain drops away. The intensity of the sensation is, is such that it grabbed his mind totally. And he had a kind of what we would call samadhi, uh, a kind of one-pointed experience of that, of that intensity that drilled down, as Bob was saying yesterday, drilled down and opened up something in him. Uh, um, so he had that experience once, and it came randomly. So again, that's not, don't go looking for it. But, but uh, the idea is that you, you don't have to automatically push away the uncomfortable feelings that might or might not come uh, uh, in your meditation or in your life. OK. We have a, a little bit of time. Let's just go, let's do a little more meditation before we stop. And we, we'll, we're going right. to do a little more meditation before we stop. And then we'll, we'll have questions and stuff this evening, right? Yes. OK. Is that all right? You're going to do another meditation? You want to do it? I'll do it. What? I'll do it. Okay. Okay. Please. Okay. So we're going to do a whole lot of nothing here. <laughs> so meditative posture, physical posture. I know we've been sitting a long time. Well, this, will be, this won't be long. Physical posture that you can maintain. Shoulder blades, aware of your shoulder blades in the back. Chest a little forward, but relax the breathing. Feel your head suspended from the ceiling by the invisible thread. Feel the chair or the cushion supporting your posture. And allow that mental posture of bare attention, of relaxed mindful awareness. And just let that attention come to your breath, to the sensation of your breath at the tip of your nose, the place where the breath enters and leaves the nostrils. Don't force the breath in any way. If you can help it, let the breath breathe you. But situate yourself, if you can find it, right at the tip of your non-existent nose. There's no nose there, really, but relatively speaking, the breath, if you can find it, it sometimes brushes past the opening of the nose, the empty space of the nose. And you can sometimes sit yourself there like a doorman in a busy building, watching the people streaming in and out, sensing the breath. Maybe a little cool as it comes in, a little warm as it goes out. And you can repeat the word, the mental note of in when you breathe in and out when you breathe out, just to keep that, that cognitive, conceptual mind that likes to think, just to give it something to do. But put the bulk of your attention on your nostrils, the breath touching the nostrils, the, the outside world entering the inside world. The actual instructions are to feel whatever sensation or lack of sensation you can find at the tip of the nose. So if you feel nothing, nothing is a good object there. If you 
feel a little something in, out. And kind of wait for the breath to happen. There's a, a big pause often at the end of the out breath. You might find yourself sitting there with no breathing activity for a bit. And just feel your lips, the touching of your lips together and give yourself the note of touching, touching. So it's just in, out, touching, touching. The raw physical sensation or lack of sensation as the breath enters the body through what we know as the nose. And if the mind jumps away, when the mind jumps away, when you notice that the mind has jumped away, wherever it's gone, thoughts, feelings, memories, plans, wishes, hopes, worries, whatever, there's always a moment when you realize, oh, wait, I'm not, what was he saying? In, out. When you realize that you're not there, bring yourself back. Take yourself by the hand, not punitively, but firmly, kindly. Come back, in, out, touching, touching. If it's a, a shallow breath, you, can, you know that it's a shallow breath. If it's a deep breath, you know it's a deep breath. If, it, if you can't find the breath, you know you can't find the breath. There, there's no good breath, there's no bad breath. There's just breath or no breath. In, out, touching, touching. And you are the breath, but you're not the breath. And you're, you are the awareness of the breath, but you're not the awareness of the breath. You know, you're all this doing nothing. All this is still happening. Just be with it.
and if you're if you're secretly thinking about stuff, you know, like you normally do, and uh, when you catch yourself doing that, don't stay there. Do, make the deliberate effort for the next thirty seconds to come back to the breath. Your your thoughts are not that important right now. Okay. Bon appétit. <laughs> so we'll come back at 7.30? Okay. Mm-hmm. We'll come back at 7.30. Yeah. This video was brought to you in part through the generous support of the Tibet House U.S. membership community and viewers like you. To learn more about the benefits of Tibet House membership, including special invites to trips around the world with Robert Thurman and geographic expeditions, please visit tibethouse.us.